By the end of Avatar The Last Airbender, Katara has not just become a hero, she has learned to deal with personal trauma, with the loss of her mother, and she has grown to accept Zuko and fight alongside him in the last Agni Kai. But her story does not end there. That's why I'm wearing my Water Tribe necklace. Spoilers for, uh... Everything? This video is brought to you with the help of today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, which does the whole keeping you safe online thing, more on them later, but if you're interested in keeping your privacy from OUR GLORIOUS CORPORATE OVERLORDS <laughs> and help the channel and our supreme leader Mishka, all hail Mishka, then go to expressvpn.com slash hfm to learn more. The world was devastated by the Hundred Year War, and Katara understood this better than most as the last survivor of a concerted effort to eradicate southern waterbenders. But we were too late. The scars of her past, this part of her character becomes important as she struggles with her place in this world that is clambering out of the ruins of war. Her arc begins in The Promise Part 1, which deals with Zuko and Aang's efforts to dismantle the Fire Nation colonies in the Northwest Earth Kingdom, restoring balance to the world as four separate nations in the year 101 AG. We will be covering many of the comics, but we'll only be discussing Katara's story in each of them, which we can divide into three major beats. At first, Katara supports the Harmony Restoration Movement in hopes of returning the world to what it used to be, what it's supposed to be like. The problems in her world have been caused by one nation, in particular the Fire Nation, interfering with the others. To Katara, removing the colonies has to be the first step away from a world that has been devastated by war, regaining what has been lost. Right? Well, Katara first begins to realise that this post-war world is more complex than she initially thought when Fire Lord Zuko backs out of the Harmony Restoration Movement, refusing to escort his citizens from the colonies and return the land to the Earth Kingdom. When confronted by Aang and Katara, Zuko walks them through the colony of Yu Dao, explaining it is the oldest of the Fire Nation colonies, that it was founded over a hundred years ago in the time of Fire Lord Sozin, and that some Fire Nation citizens had lived there for generations, that they knew nothing but their home there. Katara had firmly believed that being separate was crucial to the cultural identities of the Four Nations, but Zuko shows Katara that the Earth Kingdom people and Fire Nation citizens were living alongside one another, their cultures and trades mixing to even create some of the strongest alloy metals in the world. This sight is jarring for Katara, seeing that the Hundred Year War's legacy is not just a ruin, but some of the most economically prosperous cities in the world. This is best embodied in Kori, who exclaims that, I may be an earthbender, but through my father's bloodlines I am a Fire Nation citizen. My father taught me to always be loyal to the Fire Nation, to my people. Ultimately, Katara finds herself conflicted when Zuko and Aang disagree, Zuko arguing that it'd be disrespectful to take them from a life that they spent generations building. I won't let you do it. Do it. And who knows, maybe Katara is conflicted because she has a secret crush on Zuko. Okay, okay, I'm I'm sorry. We are not going there, shippers. We are, we are not going there. Looking back at this multicultural family, Katara suggests that Yu Dao should be an exception to the Harmony Restoration Movement. The success of these colonies doesn't justify the war in Katara's eyes, I want to be clear on that, but Katara does begin to realise that despite destroying so much, destroying her southern culture, the war has also changed the world in beginning this new culture, one that might deserve just as much protection as the others. That it would be wrong to force the world back to the way it was because this isn't the same world anymore. In the escalating conflict, Earth King Kue and Fire Lord Zuko are brought to the brink of war over Yu Dao, but Katara urges Kue that you ought to meet the people who live with your decisions. This is really the first major revelation in Katara's arc, understanding that always clinging to the past, to the way things used to be, can sometimes be damaging that you become blinded to the value of new things. Katara brings Aang and Kue to realise that they aren't just fighting to end a colony, but they are fighting a new kind of world, one that faces new challenges. What duties do we have because of the actions of our ancestors? What rights do we have because of what our ancestors lost? 
Katara is only just beginning to grapple with these questions of a post-war reconstructionist world. These are a new people with new identities that formed in the vicissitudes of war, and they require new solutions. Katara never quite arrives at a firm answer to these questions, and I really like that. Because these questions aren't easy, they're not ones that there is an objective answer to. And I think that just as we continue to grapple with them in our world, it's nice to see that Katara continues to grapple with them in hers. After the battle for Yudao, Katara goes with Team Avatar and Azula to find Zuko's mother in the search. She helps them find her, they bring her back, and they help her adjust to her old life. And though Katara accompanies them, this is really Zuko and Azula's story. Katara's story really picks up again in the rift. In this chapter of her story, Katara's beliefs are tested again when Aang discovers that a sacred air nomad site has been built over with a new industrial area, designed for mining and extraction, and the water has been poisoned with waste. Katara even meets an old friend from the southern water tribe, Nutha, working there. A man called Satoru takes them through this new factory, and once again Katara sees earthbenders and firebenders working together, just like at Yudao. And Satoru describes how this earth and fire refinery represents the future, but this time Katara sees things a little bit differently. In Yudao, the war had brought unity and progress, but here it has left behind the stains of imperialism. The spread of Fire Nation technology and the proliferation of oil and machinery has destroyed part of the heritage of the Air Nomads, a culture already on its deathbed. Seeing this, Katara fears the loss of something more in this new world, best demonstrated when Satoru shows them a fully automated machine, capable of refining materials without bending assistance at all. Katara remarks with dismay that bending is so much more elegant. This post-war world has brought modernization with it, but Katara is seeing how this very force of progress also risks the loss of old arts and traditions like bending in its wake. And she comes to understand why Aang feared so much for the survival of the Air Nomads in this era of globalization in The Promise, where he passionately argued that Air Nomad culture could not survive in a world constantly overrun by other nations. Whereas The Promise was about Katara letting go of the past and embracing the future, the Rift is about Katara not forgetting the value of the past in an ever-modernizing world. This sentiment is epitomized in Aang's meeting with Avatar Yang Chen. Traditions like Yang Chen's festival can allow you access to the guidance of the past. Roku later states how important it is to learn from not only the triumphs, but also the failures of history. Much like how Yang Chen's festival is forgotten, Katara sees how wisdom can be left behind in the name of progress and modernization. Side note, this whole interaction with Avatar Yang Chen takes place while Aang is inside the Cabbage Merchant's restaurant. He sets one up where he sells cabbage cookies, which, you know, I, I would never bake. I didn't, I, and I certainly didn't bake them about three weeks ago. This feeling is only reinforced when Katara and Sokka find their childhood friend, Nutha, being exploited in a secret mine for the refinery. Nutha heatedly points out to Katara that since the war ended, the Southern Water Tribe hasn't been doing all that well, and that she's lucky enough to have found work in the refinery. Katara feels guilty for leaving, and I think that this is all part of the legacy of globalization after the war as well. The modernized world gave Nutha a job, but it also made it so that the Southern Water Tribe could not compete economically. And how could it when its trading partners were getting all of this new technology and it was left behind? The stains of imperialism are often hidden behind a shiny new coat of paint. And this is really the first time that Katara sees the impacts of globalization and the post-war world hitting home. In the Rift Part 3, Team Avatar faces down against General Old Iron, a spirit who has grown angry with how humans have treated the land. Though Aang manages to defeat him, he is left conflicted over whether his people, his culture, and the spirits have a place in this new world of refineries, machines, and humanity. After all she has seen, this is the second major beat in Katara's arc after the last airbender. She explains that the past needs to have a place in this new world, that progress cannot be all that matters, that we do need to hold on to our heritage. General Old Iron believed that the spirits no longer have a place here. 
what if he's right? What if the spirits are just relics of the past, with no future in this human world? You're between the spirits and us, Katara says. If you have a part in our world's future, then the spirits must have one too. I don't think the past and the future are separate. They're connected, you know? By today. By us. And it's in this line that I think something deeply rooted in Katara's character comes to light. Across the show, Katara has always defined herself through her trauma, through the loss of her mother. She lied to you. She was protecting the last waterbender. Who? Me! Her mother gave her life to protect her, leaving her as the only waterbender in the Southern Water Tribe. With this, I think that Katara has always felt a sense of responsibility, of obligation, as the only person in the world who can maintain that link to her culture's past. This vital part of her culture that had almost been wiped out by the Fire Nation is preserved in her. This is also why Katara always connected more personally with her people's art and history more than Sokka ever did, which we see from the very first scene. It's not magic, it's water bending. And it's- Yeah, yeah, an ancient art unique to our culture, blah, blah, blah. And I think this is why seeing what happened to the Sacred Air Nomad site hit so hard for her. She understands what it's like to be the only person in the world who can seemingly preserve this culture that is so near to death. That it's their responsibility to preserve the past against this future rapidly taking form and inevitably encircling them. It's why she says that the past and future are connected through us. Their people's past is only connected to the future through them. Katara's arc here comes to a head when all of this, the globalization, the modernization, the post-war world, comes home in the story of North and South. It opens with Katara dreaming of her mother, reminiscing about the past and what her village used to be like before the Fire Nation took her away. And after arriving at the pole, Katara soon spots a number of penguins' letters, which will remind you of... do you remember? Well, if you don't, Sokka didn't either. It was what they did in the first episode with Aang. Though a small scene, it does demonstrate that Katara has always felt a stronger connection to her past than Sokka, best epitomized in this scene from The Runaway. When our mom died, that was the hardest time in my life. But honestly, I'm not sure I can remember what my mother looked like. You know, that scene still hits home. And it's in moments like that that you really see the impact of the war. It's not just death, it's, it's not remembering what your mother's face looks like. This way that Katara thinks becomes important, because when they arrive at the Southern Water Tribe, they find it changed. The villages have been brought together, and it has been transformed into a city with new and grand architecture. Structures built with three ore and two sh- I mean, concrete, wood, and stone. Katara's instinctual response isn't that it has evolved or grown, but that her village is gone. The past that she thought so fondly of has been swallowed up by modernization. They reconnect with old family, Gran Gran and Paku and others, and I need to show you this one image where they're being surrounded by questions about the rest of the world and one person's asking about the Fire Nation. Is it true that everything is on fire over there? Yes, Janet, it is. And did you know that in New Zealand, at age eight, we are all given our first sheep? Katara's anxieties are only reinforced when she finds that Hakoda, her father, now head chieftain, lives in a huge mansion. Sokka sees it as a grand, gleaming, and spectacular sight, but Katara worries that just like how her village has changed, her dad might have too. Hakoda explains that the Northern Water Tribe is assisting in what they call the Southern Reconstruction Project, with funding, materials, and manpower led by Melina and Malik. Katara questions her dad over whether his office feels excessive, only to be dismayed when Melina explains that they are planning for something even bigger. The most magnificent building in the history of the South, exactly what a head of state deserves, a palace. Melina explains that a palace commands respect and authority, but Katara finds herself uneasy with this. For her, it's like the outside world has suddenly come home. The bureaucracy of the Fire Nation, the metropolitan of Ba Sing Se, the palace of the Northern Water Tribe. And in the midst of all of this, in the chaos and the modernization, 
something has been lost of the simplicity of her way of life. This feeling comes back again for Katara when Melina pointedly remarks that southern food tastes off compared to northern food. The very fact a northern cuisine restaurant has been established in the south leaves Katara feeling like her culture is being minimised and pushed aside, just like Aang felt. It's at this point they are attacked, and Malik's suitcase is stolen. Katara and Sokka pursue them to the Fire Nation shipwreck, where they find a revolutionary group led by a man called Galak, a man who fought alongside their father in the war. To Katara's surprise, he is determined to preserve Southern Water Tribe culture against the rest of the world. His following tell traditional Southern Water Tribe stories to keep them alive, when most have forgotten them. Galak explains that Hakoda inviting foreigners to their shores has meant that the southern water tribe is losing what little culture it has left to protect after the war. Katara defensively points out how nations working together has worked in Yudao and in the refinery, but Galak hears none of it. They're making us into a cheap imitation of the northern water tribe. The northerners have always considered us savages. Now's their chance to impose their version of civilization on us. Katara and Sokka are forced to escape the hideout, but nonetheless, Katara finds herself agreeing with Galak, that for all others called it progress and modernizing and cooperating, it all felt like a cheap imitation of the North rather than home. In the whirlwind of Ford thinkers, something precious has been lost. And this feeling of invasion that Katara has becomes personal when she discovers that her father is romantically involved with Melina, a northerner that she doesn't trust. Sokka and Katara talk through it in the beginning of North and South Part 2, while Melina and Malik show them around a new refinery situated over the largest oil deposit in the world. A resource that Malik argues will lift up the Southern Water Tribe into modernity with money and influence. Once again, Katara is irked by how people denigrate their way of life, retorting that I didn't realise we needed any lifting up. The Southern Water Tribe wasn't as powerful as the other nations, but that was because it was different. Katara is dismayed to learn that the Fire Nation and Earth Kingdom only think that their way of life is worthy of respect. The others will only treat her people as equals if they become more like them. Adopting technological advancements or certain cultural practices, like having a single head of state. And this concept of respect from conformity is a real struggle. It's something that native populations have really grappled with in the face of imperialism. A subplot in North and South also involves Katara meeting the first two waterbenders in the Southern Water Tribe since the near genocide. Grandpaku! Brings Katara to meet Siku and Sura. Interestingly, they hide their waterbending at the bidding of their mother, just like Katara did for years. And I think this revelation was important to Katara. It was an unshouldering of a burden that she had been carrying alone for so long as the only southern waterbender. But now there are others. She doesn't have to do it alone. But before she can talk with them, they run away back into the festival, still lost in thought about how to deal with the changing of the world. Katara asks her father why he didn't tell them about Melina, explaining that she doesn't really understand us, the big us, the Southern Water Tribe. Hakoda asks her to trust him, and she agrees to, in spite of her misgivings. Side note, at the festival, there is a plushie of giant spirit ocean koi ang, but that's what I'm gonna call it, and I want it, give it to me. But the festival's brought to an abrupt end when Galak invades with his forces, asking his fellow tribesmen to join him. We came of age together, we have shared meals together, we have bled together. These are bonds of history, of family, of culture, and they are what Katara fears losing in this new era. And her worst fears are realised when Galak reveals that the Northerners planned to take the oil for themselves. That they weren't just losing their culture, but the sovereignty and independence of the Southern Water Tribe as well. And in the midst of the battle that ensues, Katara is forced to make a choice as to which side she will choose. Those of Galak, or her father. We must remove the foreigners from our midst or they will destroy us. Will you support Galak's cause? After a time of thought, Katara says no. 
and Thod cheaplocks her. To be clear, this isn't Katara rejecting traditionalism, that's still very important to her, but it is her rejecting Galak's way of protecting it. Galak and Hakoda duel in the icy tundra, Hakoda trying to save Melina. But as soon as Hakoda offers to talk as old friends, Katara watches from afar, helpless as Galak runs him through with a dagger. Galak escapes, but Hakoda manages to survive with the help of Katara's ward healing abilities, if only just. And though she did not join him, Katara retains sympathies for his cause. She is left ultimately alone, with both Sokka and her father saying that the Southern Water Tribe needs to modernise if it is going to survive. She becomes frustrated with this, saying not if it means we forget who we are. For so long, Katara has defined herself as one of the last links to a dying culture. Others have already forgotten it, but she can't because doing so would be forgetting who she is personally, and the fact that others don't care about it as much as she does hurts, because she felt that it should be something precious to them as well, seeing that it isn't can be painful. In her anger, Katara confronts Melina about the Northern Water Tribe's plans to make the Southerners pawns, but Melina says that she stopped believing in that plan a long time ago, falling for her father. Instead, she had just come to say goodbye to Hakoda, but Katara doesn't let her until Hakoda himself asks for her. At the beginning of North and South Part 3, Hakoda, Sokka, and Katara are walking together when Hakoda affirms his belief that it took people from all four nations to save the world. It will take the same to reconstruct the South. Katara asks if that perspective is a little naive. To her, it is. She has seen the post-war idealism decimate the cultural heritage of the Air Nomads, and she doesn't want the same thing to happen to her people. Globalization brings with it homogeneity, a homogeneity that marginalizes cultures that can't survive, if only through numerical disadvantage. The sudden wave of technology, the transformative industrial revolution, can be so distracting that people forget to preserve things that matter. Out of this, Katara comes to believe that collaboration may work in the economy and geopolitics, but it gives little when a culture has not managed to recover on its own. Unfortunately, Hakoda has already called a meeting with the other heads of state. Zuko, Earth King Kue, and Supreme Leader Mishka. The world is coming to the Southern Water Tribe. At the conference that evening, we see Katara struggle even more with what her people's place in this new world should be. Earth King Kue describes the Southern Water Tribe as uncivilized, and when she protests this, he retracts it only in saying that they have a lower form of civilization. But what does civilization mean here? Wealth, technology, bureaucracy, letting go of old traditions in the name of progress? The meeting is cut short when Gilnak breaks free of prison and attacks the meeting with his army, demanding that the tribe have a leader who puts his own interests before those of the world, singling Hakoda out as a traitor. In the chaos of battle, not only does Galak manage to flee into the icy tundra, but he kidnaps Earth King Kue. Not long after, Hakoda receives an ultimatum. His life for the Earth Kings at an ancient bridge traditionally used for water tribe criminals. It's here that Katara and Sokka share a moment after they've been at odds since arriving home, confronting the reality at hand. I always assumed that once we defeated Fire Lord Ozai, the South Pole would go back to the way it was supposed to be. Our lives would go back to the way they're supposed to be. Sokka offers that she might be idealizing the past, that nobody remembers what it was like before the war. Too many have died, too much has been lost already, and nobody is even alive to remember what it was like before the war. At this point, Katara becomes conflicted, but before she can respond, Gilak arrives. Though they manage to rescue Earth King Kue, Gilak falls to his death from the bridge. Melina sacrifices herself to save Hakoda, but at the last moment, Katara intervenes, saving her and finally showing her trust in both her and her father again. In the aftermath of the traditionalist rebellion, Katara visits her mother's grave, a ring of stones. She also brought flowers? Where did she get flowers from? It's a bit... icy? Katara doesn't accept the new refinery, or forget her traditional ways of life. But she does accept that the home she was longing for was impossible, because it was a home with her mother in it. For Katara, the post-war world has finally come home, 
And it's not as simple as accepting the rapid change like at Yu Dao in The Promise, nor is it as simple as clinging to an old world like at Refinery in The Rift. War transforms the world, and like she can't bring her mother back, Katara can't bring back this idyllic peacetime for the Southern Water Tribe. Instead, Katara's arc across these three stories brought her to the nuanced understanding that cultures will change in the crucible of globalization, modernization, and reconstruction, but that this change or progress is only valuable if you can also preserve your cultural identity amidst it. The difficulty is discerning which parts to preserve and protect. I like that we're never given an objective answer here. The characters still disagree about what the Water Tribe should do, about what duties we owe because of what our ancestors did, or what rights we have because of what our ancestors lost, what we should cling to and what we should let go. These are questions that we still grapple with in our day and age, and it makes sense that they would grapple with it in their world. Ultimately, this is just Katara's perspective, and her arc culminates in her final meeting with Siku and Sura, the first waterbenders in the southern water tribe since the near genocide. Katara explains that just as her mother's sacrifice ensured southern waterbending survived, that her place in this new post-war world was to preserve that art with their help, as well as with Paku, a northerner who pays respect to it by teaching it, we see that in some instances, they don't need to isolate themselves to preserve their cultural heritage. Katara's sentiment turns out to be true, that the past and the future are connected through us, through people, because that is how traditions survive, through the actions and beliefs and practices of people. Privacy. Security. Freedom. Anonymity. Long ago, your internet history lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the corporations attacked. Only the ExpressVPN, a master of the fastest speed of any VPN provider, could stop them. A hundred years passed, and my brother and I discovered that, that it was only seven bucks a month with a 30 day money back guarantee. And although his features like accessing Netflix from other countries with the highest speed possible with unlimited bandwidth while giving you high security, so great, he has a lot to learn before he's ready to save anyone. But I believe ExpressVPN can save your internet history. Go to expressvpn.com slash hfm for more info and to find out how you can get three months free. And this brings us to really the end of Katara's story, right up until she appears in Legend of Korra, though we will be getting some more comics soon, so they won't be covered in this particular video. As a note, these kids are only like five to eight years old and they can already do this. Katara could barely lift a bubble, though she had the disadvantage of, you know, not having any teachers around because they were all dead. Point is, the kids are talented. I wanted to talk through what I think is a very natural arc for Katara to deal with in the post-war world, dealing with the, the effects of colonization, imperialism, and the sister effect, which is really globalization after that. I do think that Katara would naturally want to protect these parts of her culture that she sees being decimated, and I really want to applaud the writers for really going all in on that in these stories. And after researching this video, I can say that I really want to do a video on the post-war context, imperialism, and uh, kind of the, the effects and discussion of the Avatar world in that kind of uh, realm. I think that'd be really fascinating. There's a ton of stuff to talk about that I didn't mention in this video. Uh, a lot of artistic stuff that they did, which was really interesting. In the meantime, if you want to hear more of me doing terrible jokes, come follow me on Twitter. I think that's really the only place I spend a lot of time, which is sad, but it's true. Come follow me there, otherwise I've got a Facebook, Patreon, that sort of stuff. Don't have an Instagram yet, probably should get one of those, I'm so bad at social media. <laughs> Anyways, stay nerdy, and I will see you in the future.